This is the House of Commons, as you've never seen it before. With unprecedented access, we've been filming behind the scenes for a year. That's where our laws are set, is the people that we run by. It's been a year of round-the-clock plotting and high drama. And the people sitting next to me have been in the house for like decades just saying I've never seen anything like it. We'll have to repair that iron. All played out in the ancient palace of Westminster. It's in danger of collapse. The last thing you want to see is the government building fall apart. That means your government's falling apart. In this first episode, two novice MPs seek to navigate the bewildering codes and customs of the Commons. The behaviour in there is just disgusting. I mean, really embarrassingly juvenile. And we follow the Commons' most powerful official, who runs the whole place. My goodness, that's invigorating. His job is to square the age-old parliamentary traditions with the demands of a modern democracy. This case is about hard politics, but it's also about people and emotions. It's spring 2014, and the biggest day of the year in the Commons calendar. Budget day. Inside the chamber, the security sniffer dogs are the first to do their parliamentary duty. The eyes to the right, the nose to the floor. Only MPs are allowed to sit on the Commons green benches. Yet they provide 427 seats and there are 650 MPs. So the principal doorkeeper Robin Fell and his team are ready for MPs to arrive early for an unlikely procedure to reserve their seat. Apart from the conventions of obviously the Prime Minister and the, the Cabinet on the government front bench, everybody else is in the melting pot. So if they want to be absolutely certain that they have their preferred seat, be here when the doors open at 8 o'clock, put the prayer card in, turn up for prayers, and it's yours for the day. Charlotte Leslie was elected a Conservative MP in the 2010 election. She's still getting used to the rituals of the House, like the fact that for over four centuries, the Commons Day begins with morning prayers. We actually turn to the back, and um, we all turn to face the wall when we do one bit of prayers, because they, I think the story goes that at the time when to be a Catholic was a little bit sensitive. Um, it was courtesy not to let people see that you were a Catholic and you were doing the crossing bit. But morning prayers is now also a seat booking system. Theoretically, members respect the fact that that is your seat being booked for the whole day, provided you're here for three-minute prayers when the speaker arrives. If you're not here for prayers and your prayer card is in, uh, then one of the member officers of the house will take the card out and rip it up. McLeod? Yeah. Aubrey? Mm -hmm. Newton? Yeah. Ellis? Yes. Yeah. Gibb? Yeah. Harrington? Robert Halfon, who was born with cerebral palsy, is another Tory newcomer from 2010. I put my prayer card right in the middle at the back there. It's where you usually see it. There's a lot of leg room, and I've, I've tried to uh, bag that place since I since I got in. On days like this, it's a bit like the Germans on the beaches putting their towels on the deck chairs because you have to rush in, you have to be here really early to get your car. But I kind of made that place my home. I will sit at the back, make a quick getaway, so you can shout. Yeah, you know, take a book along in case you get bored as well. Right. On this showpiece day for the government, the greatest crush for seats is on the Tory side. And Labour's veteran heckler Dennis Skinner is unimpressed. Most of them come in on the high days down of his life, the budget. I come in every day, and I've done uh, for 40 odd years. 
But I remember when uh, people used to wear morning coats and top hats and goodness knows what else. And I don't mean the 19th century, I mean the 20th century. Really? But all that sort of glamour seems to have gone now. So what, are you, what, are you, what are you wearing on your head for the special occasion? Oh, well, oh, now isn't that the great uh, cause of much uh, speculation? My goodness, not much choice left, is there? It's 8.30 and there's not a spot. There's one in the back there, John. There is, there is. There we go, it's official, I have my space, and as long as I turn up to Perez, it's mine. There's one backbench MP who doesn't need to worry about his prayer card. Sir Peter Tapsell, the longest serving member who's known as the father of the house. By custom, Sir Peter has his own special seat, but still insists on putting in a prayer card. The reason I put it in is uh, because I don't want the embarrassment of turning somebody out of their seat who may not know the convention in a crowded house, particularly if it was a lady, it would be quite a difficult thing to do. And the problem would arise, did I sit on her knee or, or did she sit on mine? Sarah Champion, the Labour MP for Rotherham, cuts a rather different figure from the old boys of the Commons. She won a by-election in 2012 when her Labour predecessor resigned and was later jailed for expenses fraud. When I got selected for my by-election, um, I was told that I had unparliamentary hair. <laughs> I was meant to do something about it, um, but I still don't know what unparliamentary hair is or what I'm meant to do. <laughs> right, and here we... <laughs> Sarah Champion used to run a children's hospice. She's one of only 148 female MPs. The other 502 are men. Every day, particularly when it's a sunny day like this, when I walk in, I go, oh my God, they're going to rumble that it's me, rather than a proper MP coming in. I hope I never get over it, though. And she refuses to join the budget day scramble to bag a seat in the chamber. What's the point of being there at seven in the morning? I can see if it's a shoe sale, but not, not to listen to an older old men screaming at each other. Final copies of the budget in plain packaging arrive at the Chancellor's official residence in Downing Street. The contents are market sensitive, so tight secrecy is maintained until after George Osborne's speech. Another envelope of budget secrets is brought to the Commons for the Deputy Speaker. By tradition, he chairs the budget debate, but to avoid leaks, he won't open it till he's in the chamber. Chairman, for you, the sealed envelope's in the chamber. Oh my word, very tempting, isn't it, what we've all... <laughs> Let me pop this down. Let's put it on here. There's cards on every part of the government benches. There's not a spare place. Today will be the real starting up for the general election. So I think that's also going to add to the intensity. So we're just going to be aware of the heat that will be in there. It's two hours till the Chancellor speaks. And in the bowels of the Commons, there's a mass delivery of strictly embargoed copies of all the budget measures. MPs won't be able to collect them till the Chancellor has sat down. Mostly, people will want the Red Book, the Budget 2014, in all its glory, not released for another hour and a quarter at least. I'm all set. Yeah. Good. Hi, Hi Nicky. Danny. Hi. Paul. Hey. 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 in the box. We're ready to go. When you go out there, are a lot of cameras. Yes. It comes in, not done before. We've got a good budget, so we're going to go out there and sell it. Very good. Thanks for your help in putting it together. I always try to look smart, but today I'm going to be my best. 
You know what happens to theatre. Politicians are all budding thespians. They all want to be on that stage and they all want to play the part. And there is no bigger day for the stage than today. Sarah Champion is directed to a place in the gods, but she doesn't have a prayer of finding a seat in the chamber. The upper gallery is where she can watch, but can't speak. Can you get into there? Here she'll catch the first glimpses of what the government and the opposition regard as the key to the general election. As Bill Clinton's spin doctor once put it, it's the economy, stupid. The Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Right Honourable George Osborne. Built on the site of William the Conqueror's first palace, the mother of parliaments is where the laws that affect all our lives are made. Rebuilt in Victorian times as a Gothic fantasy palace, it's an eight-acre jumble of buildings and courtyards. With a hundred staircases, over a thousand rooms, and three miles of passages. It's a very easy place to get lost in, even for long-serving MPs like Winston Churchill's grandson. It's an extraordinary place. You know, I've, I found somewhere the other day I never even knew existed at those points. And, and um, you've been here 30 years. And I've been here 30 years. What was that? What did you find? It was a bar. A bar. <laughs> it's such a rabbit warden of a place. I mean, I still, you know, from time to time find myself not knowing and having to ask instructions or directions. When you stand in members' lobby and you see the statue of Churchill and you see the broken arch that is what remains after the chamber was bombed in the Second World War, you, you do feel a real sense of history in this place. It's a sort of mixture of a, it looks half like a museum, half like a church, half like a school. Many MPs share David Cameron's view. They call the Commons Hogwarts. And if there is a Dumbledore, He's the Commons' top official, the Clerk of the House, Sir Robert Rogers. Right, see you later, right? Yeah. Right. The back door of his official residence in Parliament Street provides Sir Robert with a short commute through his domain. Morning. I suppose I have quite an odd job in some ways. Morning. I think most of my predecessors back across the centuries would recognise one half, which is being the principal constitutional advisor to the House, but combined with that is the job as Chief Executive of the House of Commons Service of 2,000 people. In the chamber each day I wear a, a court coat, um, black trousers, black waistcoat, stick up collar and a white bow tie and I wear a barrister's bob wig and a silk gown. It's really going and dressing up, which is uh, quite amusing in a way. But I think there is a serious side to it um, and that is that the formality that we have, the way the doorkeepers dress, the way that uh, the chamber is laid out, provide a rather dignified framework within which the rough and tumble of politics takes place. Like Sir Robert, the principal doorkeeper Robin Fell has worked here for over 40 years, and they share a delight in customs from the past. Morning, Robin. Until recently, snuff was provided free to members. I 
Well, that's, that's invigorating. Yes, but it's, 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 it's a conscious effort. I don't have it as serious what I refer to as weapons grade yeah, stuff. That's right. it's, still, it's still pretty good stuff. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Robin Fell runs a team of doorkeepers who wear formal dress. They're the commons internal security staff, trained in police restraint techniques. They're also messengers who see themselves as the eyes and ears of the commons. That is a doorkeeper's badge. That one's dated 1837. The chain is pure gold. The badge is silver gilded over. And the little dangly at the bottom, that is pure gold. The uh, winged messenger of the gods. Not the course that I saying we deliver messages to gods. Members of Parliament. <laughs> In his role as chief executive, Sir Robert manages a team of workers, from painters to plumbers, from cleaners to clockmakers. Sir Robert's central problem is how to run a 21st century parliament in a mock gothic palace that is falling apart at the seams. We're trying to deal with the problems as they come up. Now you see up there, that's an example of what I was talking about. Uh, and that's where we've got water coming in. And you can see the, the damage there to the stonework, which is going to take a terrific amount of work. And you can see the damage too on that wonderful complex window over to the right. And there are a couple of dozen places where water is simply coming in through the roof, up and down the palace. We're trying to run a modern parliament in a Victorian building. The punchy Tory Charlotte Leslie sees herself as a new breed of MP. I've always been angry. Um, the reason I'm in politics is I get angry about injustice and the way things are and I want to change it. Um, but sometimes, especially in politics, you can't and it's immensely frustrating. And you do feel like smashing a brick wall down. I was a very naughty kid and my mum took me boxing and uh, I didn't end up in the gang but I did end up in Parliament. A former lifeguard and journalist, Charlotte Leslie narrowly won her Bristol seat from Labour in 2010. I hadn't had any sleep for something like 40 hours. And then after a day of doing media, um, I finally went to bed at about 11 o'clock the next night. And I woke up and I thought, good Lord, I'm an MP. Arriving in the Commons is a daunting experience for new MPs. It feels like a very intimidating place, I think. It feels like a club. I remember I was in my first parliamentary Labour Party meeting with my brother and I sort of saw him across the crowded room and I thought, it's, uh, who would have thought it? I remember when I first came here, opening the door to somebody, because that's the way you are, you open the door. And um, people just troop through as if that was my job. And not one of them said, ta, you know what I mean? Thanks very much. The Commons retains the look and feel of a Victorian gentleman's club, and at its heart is the legendary Members Tea Room, run by Gladys Dixon, who often sings as she works. She opens up the tea room at seven in the morning, as it actually serves MPs cut price breakfast, lunch, tea, supper, and drinks. Gladys is just a wonderful figure. She's a force of nature. She's got a cheery word for everyone. She never doesn't have a smile on her face. She's just the most adorable woman, and every time I see her, I feel better. MPs regard the tea room as their inner sanctum, where they can gossip and plot in total privacy, in what they call their holy of holies. Here is for conservative and officers from the house. So conservative tend to stay all on this side. And this is liberal. And here is Northern Ireland table. And when you come on this side, it's all for labor. When I first came here, I sat in the wrong place. And somebody said to me, well, 
that's where Labour sit. And I thought, well, it's a free table. It's like, you know, it's all these old traditions that, you know, you go in a coffee shop and you sit where you want, don't you? The Commons has opened its own coffee shop in a glistening annex called Portcullis House. But the new building hasn't put an end to some MPs' old ways. It's sort of playground stuff. So if they see any weakness, whether it's about your relationship, the way you look, um, something that's happened to you in the past, you'll hear it. And it's little... Thank you very much. Little snide comments. Um, just designed to get under the radar and put someone off the game. It's really... It's not nice. The central role of MPs is to seek to hold the government of the day to account. And the month after the budget, MPs will be voting on one of the coalition's most controversial projects, HS2, the high-speed rail link from London to the north. But as both front benches support the bill, any member proposing to rebel will have to defy their party whips, the shadowy groups of MPs in charge of discipline. The Tory with a Boris look-alike hair, Michael Fabricant, is one MP who plans to vote against the official party line. I don't want to be on the dark side, as the whips call it, and uh, be seen as some sort of uh, non-team player. But just occasionally, when you think the government's got it badly wrong, you have to make a stand, and this is what I'm doing over HS2. Constituents who live on the proposed HS2 route have come to the Commons to lobby their MPs. Every MP has to balance the conflicting pressures of party, constituency and conscience. Well done. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. It's very good the position you take. Thank you very much. Labour's Sarah Champion will be voting with the government. It's a lot easier for me because, to be honest, the area that benefits the most is, is Yorkshire. So um, for my constituents, there are a few that are going to be impacted on it. And with them, I went and talked to them and spoke to them and explained my position. But if it was going straight through the middle of my patch, I can see why you'd want to make a big stink about it. The debate is likely to run late, and the whips have told their MPs to stay to the end, to be present for the vote. I actually have a, an emergency duvet in my office for really late nights. At 11pm, after a five-hour debate, the Speaker John Burko puts the bill to the House. The MPs' shouts of aye or no trigger a vote, known as a division. Once the bell rings, MPs have eight minutes to choose the yes or no lobby before the doors are locked. As MPs come into the voting lobbies, they're counted by sharp-eyed whips who act as tellers. All MPs from the humblest to the grandest must join the scrum. The whole system of the voting lobby is an extraordinary institution uh, because it's a place you walk through and it's a place where ministers, leaders, MPs have conversations. It's partly an opportunity for people to talk business, to talk politics. Just 41 MPs are prepared to vote against the bill in defiance of their party whips. A thumping majority vote for the bill. But a number of MPs with doubts about HS2 told us privately they saw no point in putting themselves in the black books of the whips, as the result was a foregone conclusion. If you want to make a point, you only have so many rebellions. After every, with each rebellion, the currency of your rebellion goes down. So you do have to think about where you want to use your, your chips, if you like. So it's important to be able to keep the pounder dry and be someone. So if you do rebel, people say, "Oh, 
Oh, seven social bells. Oh, we might need to have a rethink about that. <laughs> The voting has taken over half an hour, and it's close to midnight when MPs can finally make their getaway. On occasions when we've got very large numbers going through one lobby, it's like the black hole of Calcutta, and when you've got several votes following each other, you're spending a lot of time hanging about waiting for the next vote. So there's an enormous challenge here to bring Parliament into the 21st century. We should have a smart card, and as long as we're on the premises, we should be able to vote sensibly like everyone else would think we would do. MPs come in all shapes and sizes, and they're constantly on the move, from committee meetings to party briefings and dealing with constituents. New members find it hard to discover how best to work the system. All MPs suffer from chronic job insecurity, especially those like Charlotte Leslie with marginal seats, for whom the next election could be curtains. One way of showing her constituents she's working hard for them is if she can get called to speak at the highest profile Commons event, Prime Minister's Questions. We have got here the order paper and this is what MPs will wave if they're feeling particularly incensed about something. But its mu much more useful purpose is that it's got the summary agenda for today. She wants to get government support for a new football stadium for Bristol Rovers. It's probably not going to make national headlines, um, but it might make local headlines. But there's a great deal of competition among MPs to be called at Prime Minister's Question Time. So Tracy Jessup a Commons clerk, organises a selection system, as nearly 300 backbenchers apply most weeks. Right, can I get one question to the Prime Minister? Is that okay? Show these three forms there. Like filling in a lottery card, Charlotte Leslie has to put in an application form. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Tracy Jessup put Charlotte Leslie's name, along with all the other MPs who've applied, into a computerised ballot. The 15 members whose names come up are the only ones guaranteed to be called at the following week's PMQs. It literally is completely random. It doesn't know what party people are from. It's not seeking to achieve party balance. People certainly have theories about luck. Some members believe that if they come into the office to table uh, their oral, especially their PMQ, that they're more likely to come out than if they e-table it via our electronic system. While well, the Tory Charlotte Leslie is seeking a platform at Prime Minister's Questions, Labour's Sarah Champion wants to use Parliament to have a real impact on a scandal that's been hitting the headlines. Child sexual exploitation is massive and is national, but I've now been given a voice, and I think it would be so negligent of me not to use that voice and shout really loudly. I want to find ways to strengthen the law, so it's become a bit of a crusade. I've, I've been told it's impossible for an opposition backbencher to change the law. I'd rather try and fail than do nothing, because for too long people have been doing nothing, and that's why this abuse has been going on. First, she has to find her way from glossy portcullis house to the Commons office that deals with government bills. Where do we go to the public bill office? If you come with me. Thank you. Sarah Champion wants to amend the government's justice bill. At present, somebody trying to groom a child for sex must make contact twice before it's an offence. She wants prosecution after just one contact. She seeks advice from a Commons clerk, Georgie Holmes Skelton. Right, I need help. <laughs> okay. I don't know if we can shoehorn these in. Sure, yeah. But if we can, it would be phenomenal to try. My my reading, I, I, I've gone through what, what you're trying to do here. Yeah. So in terms of the scope of this bill, new clauses like this, yeah. I think are entirely reasonable. Yay! I think that's absolutely fine. The third one is slightly different. I don't know the language. 
that isn't easy. Mm -hmm. This feels particularly technical in some bits of it. It's just yeah. so impenetrable, some of it. I spent most of my days reading bits of legislation, and of course, one, I looked at it and I went, I just got no way. It's not only me then. No, no. <laughs> See, Learning to understand Parliamentese comes with the territory of being a new MP. Sarah Champion isn't just struggling with procedural language, but with an institution that was designed for gentlemen members of yesteryear. Charles Kennedy was the baby of the house when he was first elected 30 years ago, age 23. How are you today? Very good, sir. Yeah, very good. Good, good. Looking forward to the recess? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> you may say that I couldn't possibly come in. Every trip around the Commons is still something of a voyage of discovery for the former Lib Dem leader. That is a cigar lighter. Well, all these years I've been walking past this and I've never really paid much attention to it. If that's the lighter, it must have been a hell of a size of cigar. Must have been Churchill in mind, huh? And then the members' cloakroom, which pretty much lives up to its name. It's the cloakroom for the members. I suppose the only idiosyncratic feature are these um, pinkish ribbons. And would you believe this is for honourable and right honourable members once they've hung their coats to hang their swords. There you are. I have to say I've never seen one of them used in all the decades I've been here, but if you wanted to avail yourself of the opportunity, this is the place to come. Just spot this here, look, just, just there. What? Just in oh! <laughs> now look at that. This is the place you say something, and the minute you say it, it's contradicted. Well, I suppose that's what the Mother of Parliaments is supposed to be about. Somebody has actually got a wooden sword attached to their tassel. And that doesn't give anything away. Well, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. Because I don't know who the MP for that particular constituency is. Well, there you are. There's always a first for everything, and we didn't make that up. Each morning, Robert Rogers and other Commons top brass meet the Speaker John Burko in his grand office. Sir Robert claims that the Commons' biggest problem is how the old should live with the new, and that despite appearances, he welcomes the challenge of change. I may wear 18th century clothes, it doesn't give me an 18th century mind. Sir Robert sees himself as a thoroughly modern man. He's determined to cut down the Commons paper mountain. The House produces 18 million printed pages a year, including committee reports, draft bills, and the daily Hansard record of every word spoken in the chamber. I'm certainly not frightened of new technology here. I mean, new technology is at our disposal. Have you got a Hansard? Each day's Hansard report includes many pages of written answers by ministers to MPs' questions. But Sir Robert's reform has brought an end to the traditional system. That's the debate and question time, and those are the written answers. And after September, um, all of those will be done electronically and put online. It'll save us about £800,000 a year um, recurring, as well as uh, saving a good few trees as well. I've been here four years, four years and a couple of months' time, and I haven't seen an enormous digitalisation of the Commons in that time. I mean, to be honest, it really is very backward. We've only just got Wi-Fi in our offices. MPs constantly complain about the Commons IT system, but Sir Robert has bigger headaches. He's concerned that the building itself is falling apart. As clerk of the Commons, Sir Robert is the legal owner of Big Ben. It's due for its five-year checkup, which will be a barometer for the state of the whole house. We'll be having a team of abseilers abseiling down in front of the dials. They'll clean the dials on the outside and they'll be doing a condition report of the paint 
the glazing, all the glass work, but especially what condition the centre of the hands are. The abseilers attach ropes to anchor points in the belfry at the top of Big Ben. They plan to lower themselves down to clean the clock and assess its state of repair. The palace specialist clockmakers disconnect the four pairs of clock hands. No, okay. The hands are so well balanced, you can actually see that he's just doing it one-handed. So you're moving a 14-foot minute hand, a 9-foot long hour hand, just with one hand on the inside. Time's that. 12 next. From 60 metres above the ground, the abseilers will have to lower themselves past 300 panes of glass covering the clock face. <laughs> From down the bottom it looks like it's pristine. From up here you can see that there is paintwork flaking away, uh, the gold leaf has come off and the glass is a lot dirtier than it looks down here. If you could just give us a good close-up shot of the bottom of the dial where the black yep. paint's coming off. No problem at all, we'll get that in for you. Wow, that's brilliant. Right above your left hand there, yeah, just above Steve's hand, where it is now, there. There? Yeah, is that blowing, is it? It's blowing in all directions there. What they've spotted is that the uh, the paint's flaking off and the stone underneath's getting powdery, which means that it's going to get more porous and the water's going to get in. So it's, it's never going to get better, it's just going to start getting worse again. It's the clock face of England, really. This is where our Parliament are. That's where our laws are set. These are the people that we're run by. Unless they're done soon, repairs to the world's most iconic clock could run into many millions of pounds. The Palace of Westminster often looks like one great building site. And the authorities have to decide how much longer they can make do and mend the old Victorian building to support a modern parliament. Successive generations have adapted the disused giant chimney above central lobby in the commons to fresh use. We've utilised the original chimneys to run various types of cabling down throughout the building after there was no longer the requirement to use the uh, fireplaces and so forth. Looking up and seeing where all the smoke and soot from all the chimneys came and then suddenly we turn around here and we've got fibre optics. That's amazing. Portcullis has comms from two Palace of Westminster third floor new frame room. It doesn't really got a label. The people who maintain the estate are absolute geniuses. They manage in the most uh, challenging of circumstances to keep the show up and running. But we can't very long put off some really serious uh, restoration and renewal. In the modern world of Portcullis House, it's a big day for Sarah Champion. Oh, my lunch. For three weeks she's been attending committee meetings to scrutinise the government's criminal justice and courts bill. I think in about two hours I might change the law to protect children better. Which is pretty cool, isn't it? You don't do that every day on a Thursday. <laughs> Today she'll be in the spotlight to make the case for her amendments to the bill. The details of the bill are being scrutinised line by line by a cross-party committee of MPs, including the Justice Minister Jeremy Wright. After 30 hours in committee, Sarah Champion finally gets her turn. Thank you, Mr Crosby. It's a great pleasure to serve under your chairmanship once again. She has to persuade the committee 
that her amendment, which will make it harder for child groomers to escape justice, will protect children. New Clause 9 would mean that the perpetrator would only have to make one contact to be guilty. Minister, please don't let this committee sit and wait. Minister, can I start by thanking her more generally for the work that she has done? I think she's made a very powerful argument. I do have some reservations. She now faces a dilemma. The Minister won't accept her amendment in the way she's worded it. If it goes to a vote, she'll probably lose. So she has to decide whether to make a tactical withdrawal in the hope that the government will include their own version of it in the bill. I thank the Minister uh, very much for um, taking seriously the new clause that's put in front. Um, I will withdraw uh, the new clause, um, but I would like to have the, the opportunity if I could come and discuss it further if he needs additional information. Thank you. Is it the Committee's pleasure that the new clause be withdrawn? Aye. 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 withdrawn. Sarah Champion won't get her amendment in today, but she still has a chance to convince the government of her idea in the hope that they'll include a similar clause at a later stage. I'm knackered. I would have loved the Minister to say, yes, we'll adopt them, we'll put them straight into the bill. But that was never going to happen because I'm on the opposition. What I'm really, really, really hoping for is that when it comes back to the chamber, my new clause will be in there. And if they call it theirs, you know, whatever. It's about making change, it's not about ego. <laughs> it may be many weeks before she finds out whether all her months of hard work have paid off. For backbench MPs like Sarah Champion and Charlotte Leslie, there's one day each week when they get a chance of challenging the government at the very top. Prime Minister's question time. Every Wednesday, the Prime Minister sets off from Downing Street to his office in the Commons. He clutches his file known as the Plastic Fantastic, with post-it notes marking subjects he thinks will come up. There isn't a Wednesday that you don't feel total fear and trepidation about what is about to happen. Particularly, normally I'm sitting here preparing for Prime Minister's questions. About five minutes beforehand, you, you think, oh, you know, <laughs> have I got to do this again? Um, and I think Prime Ministers have always felt that. If PMQs is a nervous ordeal for the Prime Minister, he's no less so for the other key actor in the drama, the leader of the opposition. Once you're in it, you sort of forget about the nerves, and it's trying to do the best job you can. It's the anticipation is sort of, what I find, is worse than the reality. I've not met no leader of the opposition or prime minister that ever says they look forward to prime minister's questions. When I took over this job, David Cameron said, you're not going to find yourself looking forward to it. William Hague said the same to me. Tony Blair has said the same to me. Ed Miliband! Yeah. Mr Speaker, can you tell us, was the number of people having to wait more than the guaranteed two months for cancer treatment has got better or worse? Yeah. There are 7,000 more doctors. There are 4,000 more nurses. There's over 1,000 more midwives. The NHS is getting worse on his watch, and there's only one person to blame, and it's him. Honestly, if he can't do better than that, even on the NHS, he really is in trouble. Now, two party leaders just exchanged personal insults across the dispatch boxes between them. My toes curl when I hear it. It would have been inconceivable 25 years ago that party leaders would address each other like that across the floor of the House. The behaviour in there is just disgusting. I mean, really embarrassingly juvenile screaming and the fact that, you know, it's men in their 50s and 60s doing it. It's, it's just distasteful. Prime Minister's Questions is the theatre of politics. And that's quite right. It can't all be done in dusty committee rooms. When important issues are being discussed, when you think your opponents are wrong and what they would do would be damaging to the nation's interest, have to do it with some passion and some verve. 
We allow unmanned fixed cameras televised PMQs. There are very severe restrictions on what the public has shown. But we were given access for the first time to film on the floor of the house. Will you find a safe place for this camera group so that he can film without getting in our way? As far as I can see, the camera crew is certainly not interfering with the business of the house and everybody is safe. It's Wednesday the 14th of May. And the first act of the day's political theatre is the speaker's procession. Acts of strangers. I think that I'm the acoustics in here. You get a natural silence. Oh, I'm talking in a whisper. I'm afraid of this already. Behind the ceremonial scenes, party strategists from the government and opposition are at work as commons choreographers. Both sides are plotting how to turn the day's PMQs to their advantage. Before each PMQ, if we either have a question or want to fold, we have like a team strategy meeting because PMQs are different from sort of any other questions because we try and have like an orchestrated sort of team approach to it. I mean, more than anything else, it's our only chance to hold the Prime Minister accountable. Um, so if we all go off on different tangents, it's sort of a bit chaotic, so I think it's more about making it um, focused, strategic, sort of on target, giving him as much of a bashing as we can, basically. We don't need to be told to cheer Ed when he stands up. We don't need to be told to jeer or to make fun of Cameron or some of his more loyal obsequious backbenchers. We just do that because we're Labour MPs. Soon it will be time for the bobbing to begin. It means MPs who've not been lucky in the computerised ballot bob up and down in the hope of catching the eye of the Speaker John Burko. He'll alternate bobbers with questioners from the ballot. The Conservative MP Andrew Percy bobs most weeks to try to question the PM on constituency matters. I have a record of failure when it comes to the uh, PMQ's ballot. Whenever I've applied, I've never been called out. I mean, I don't try every week, uh, so I have to rely on the free hits instead, which are the ones that the uh, speaker calls on the day itself. But he knows that if he gets what's called a free hit, there'll be pressure to push the National Party political line. Every week, David Cameron's parliamentary private secretary Gavin Williamson circulates an email to members encouraging helpful questions. The head of PMQs, we get an email, it's just come through at 11.06, and these are some suggested topics that would be helpful, the Prime Minister would be happy to receive a question on. So, so, so which of these, this is a, uh, an email from the Prime Minister's parliamentary process, yes. suggesting questions. Yes, suggesting uh, questions. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So let's see what we've got today. Um, so suggested free hits, uh, we've got the OECD has joined the IMF in forecasting that the UK will have the fastest growing economy in the developed world. So obviously the question will be, does the Prime Minister agree this proves our long-term economic plan is working? Um, question suggesting we talk about being pro-business, pro-jobs. So what they want is, you know, does the Prime Minister agree with me that our long-term economic plan, there's that phrase again, uh, is giving more people who want to work hard the security of a regular pay packet. Yes. The big beasts of the Commons jungle arrived just before noon. Sometimes our lot cheer Ed Miliband when he walks in, and nothing could be worse for the Labour Party than the Conservatives giving him a big cheer. And they do the same to us, of course. Within minutes, there's a whole lot of bobbing going on. And some on the Tory benches follow the suggested script. Stevenage continues to lead the economic recovery. And unemployment figures today show our long-term economic plan is working. Yeah. 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 Well, what 
honourable friend is, is right. In, in Stevenage, unemployment has fallen by 24% over the last year, which shows that our long-term economic plan is working. Does the Prime Minister agree that the building of vital roads like the A5 M1 link Dunstable Lawton Bypass will create even more jobs? Yeah. And that continued infrastructure investment like this is a key part of our long-term economic plan. It's always so obvious when somebody's just been handed, you know, read this out, and it's pathetic. I mean, I just can't understand how anybody wants to get elected to a parliament, to any representative body, but least of all to the House of Commons, and then just be handed out a couple of sentences written by somebody else and say, read this out. Doesn't the Prime Minister agree he's doing a great job this week and will do an even better one next week? What is the point? In politics, you've got to try and have a clear message, and uh, my team, there are some messages we want to get across. We want to explain we've got a long-term economic plan. We want to explain that we're on the side of people who work hard. And if you're saying it's appalling that Tory MPs should possibly uh, use any of these phrases, I would say, well, politics is about the team putting across a team message, and so people shouldn't be too worried about that happening in prime questions. It's three months since Sarah Champion sought to persuade the government to include her amendment designed to deter child molesters in its justice bill. And she's been tipped the wink to expect good news when the government's amendments are published today. This place just relies on gossip and rumour. So, you know, there isn't a timetable and literally it was the minister pulling me out of the chamber saying it's going to be in. Um, so, this time please. <laughs> Really, really hope. We have some very good news for you this morning. Is it in? Well, Let me see let's it. have a look. It's in. There you go. It's it's your amendment. Oh, that's brilliant. Oh, that's absolutely brilliant. Perfect. Oh, I'm beside myself with excitement. It's, it's great. <laughs> it's finally in. It is in print. It's actually going to happen. Um, I've made a change that's going to protect children better. Once a bill has been passed by the Commons, it will be signed off by the clerk. Following the 700-year-old tradition, he writes in Norman French, Soibé au Seigneur, let it be sent to the Lords. No bill is going to become law until it is agreed upon by the three parts of Parliament. So the Lords and the Commons have to agree, and the Queen agrees by giving it her royal assent. But obviously there has to be an absolutely authentic and authoritative copy that goes between the two houses. Tied up in green ribbon, the colour of the commons, the final bill is physically walked along the corridor to the House of Lords. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Message for the Lords. I always think that history should be our inspiration and not our jailer. I take it myself up to the bar of the House of Lords, bow to my officer number, hand the bill over. But at the same time, the text of the bill is on the shared drive between the two public bill offices, using some of the most advanced text handling software in the world. So that combination of the old and the tradition is a really good example of how they have got absolute cutting-edge technology, but there is a picturesque side to it as well. It's early July, and today is almost the last session of Prime Minister's Questions before the summer recess. And Charlotte Leslie has won the Commons Lottery. She's come top of the computer ballot, and so is guaranteed to ask David Cameron the first question. Phil, the first question, there's more pressure on you to do something that the Prime Minister would particularly want you to say. First, she must select the best position from which to ask her question. I'm just deciding on my place. I've got a choice, a luxury choice of three here. So I think I'm going to go for... 
if you're right behind the Prime Minister, it looks a bit weird when if he turns right round to look at you. And so here, I can look at him, he can look at me, but none of us are kind of craning our necks. Because I'm kicking off, I'm the first question, I've never done that before. It's supposed to be quite national and big, but I've got a really burning local issue that I need to talk about. So I'm going to try and weave in some grand national stuff um, into my local issue. It's still breakfast time, and Charlotte Leslie knows that three hours from now, she'll become famous for five minutes. I'm going to go down to Terry's Cafe, which does a nice porridge. Um, there's a tea room I can have breakfast in, but there are times when you don't always want to be surrounded by um, MPs. And you know what? I realise I've gone the wrong way. I was so busy looking at my phone, I've gone the wrong way. This happens a lot. <laughs> I'm a bit apprehensive. I'm just anxious to get it right. Um, I'll probably get a few butterflies before I stand up and give it a shaky just a few seconds before. But I'm just quite anxious to get the words right and not trip over it all. Morning. It's just 14 minutes till the start of BMQs, the best attended event of the Commons week. And MPs on both sides understand what it's like to be top of the bill. All of a sudden, you know, when you hear your name, what was I going to start with again? I can't remember what I was going to start with. The pressure is immense. You have never felt that kind of pressure. As an MP, when you stand up at Prime Minister's Questions and every one of your colleagues from all sides of the House is looking at you, and you know that this is the most viewed event of Parliament's week, Prime Minister will be entering very, very shortly. And then we'll be kicking off. So everything's done now, so all we're doing now is just waiting for it to start. Questions to the Prime Minister. Questions to the Prime Minister. Charlotte Leslie. Driver of our welcome economic growth, there's been investment in new commercial enterprises. Does my right on more friend agree that the speedy completion of the Sainsbury's and Bristol Rovers deal is a key part of Britain's fight back to prosperity, not only in achieving a new stadium for the South West, but unleashing hundreds of jobs, affordable housing, business growth, and rail infrastructure plans? And will he do all he can to hasten the completion of this Sainsbury's deal? visited my honourable friend's constituency recently, I know how passionately she feels about this important development. Not only will this mean a new home for Bristol Rovers, but it will mean more jobs, more growth and better infrastructure for Bristol. It's how long you can keep going with the little things you want to mention before everyone goes berserk and starts sort of chucking stuff at you metaphorically. Um, and yeah, it's like many things, you don't actually remember it very well. But at the time you're just thinking, don't cock up, don't cock up, don't cock up. The clerk of the Commons, Sir Robert Rogers, has come to appear like a permanent parliamentary fixture. But he's suddenly stunned MPs by informing the Speaker that he intends to retire early. I have to inform the House that I have received the following letter from the clerk of the House. As clerk of the House, I have been fortunate indeed to have the best job in the service of any Parliament. Indeed, one of the best jobs in the world. I have spent much of my career seeking to make the House and its work, and the work of its members, better understood. This House is the precious centre of our parliamentary democracy. And with all my heart, I wish it well. Yours sincerely. Yeah. Applause in the House is extremely rare, a break with centuries of tradition. That's on parliamentary. I think the Robert would not have approved. Um, so I just went here, here, rather than uh, uh, applauding. I think applause is a little bit more than the show of the House of Commons. I've always echoed in my ears. I think I shall never forget it. 
The moment when the house just burst into applause and it went on and on was really moving, really moving. This case is about hard politics, but it's also about people and emotions, and I don't think one should be too uh, apologetic about emotion occasionally. Over the following weeks, a fierce battle will break out as the Commons seeks to find a replacement for Sir Robert Rogers. Pitted against each other are those who value its historic traditions and those who believe the Commons needs to be dragged kicking and screaming into the 21st century. In her Commons office, the shoe-loving Sarah Champion feels she's learning to work the system at Westminster since her success in amending the Justice Bill. When a report into child sex abuse in her Rotherham constituency becomes big news in the summer, she decides to make use of the parliamentary platform she has most despised, PMQs. Sarah Champion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The horrific, vile and disgusting abuse suffered by children in my constituency should never have been allowed to happen. The victims have still not got the support they deserve and the criminals are still on the streets. So when will the Prime Minister appoint the Chair to his inquiry into child abuse so that no child will be let down by statutory agencies again? Yeah. Really good. I really felt that the Prime Minister listened to what I said. Yeah, I was really, really, really grateful that I got in and asked the question. Well spoken. It was very good. Thank you ever so much. I appreciate your response as well. <laughs> Next time, what really goes on behind the scenes at the state opening of Parliament? The coronation numbers. Lovely. And we discover some unlikely alliances across the house. Talking to a Tory? No, I've never had that to in my life. And we show just how far some MPs will go in the call of duty. To find out more about this series, go to bbc.co.uk slash inside the commons and follow the links to the Open University. Coming up, politics at the heart of comedy. Strong, savvy and satirical Rory Brenner's coalition report. Brand new next here on BBC Two. And drama on BBC Four with one of the other arms of government under investigation. Sir Alec Guinness stars in Smiley.